Namaste, Namaskaram, Hello India. I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. I'm Paul Ravindranath and I'm really excited today to bring to you a brand new YouTube video series called Ask Google Devs India. This will be a monthly video series where you get to ask us anything on Google technologies. We will get developer advocates and experts to answer your questions. To kick off this brand new show, we begin with a focus on Kotlin this month. Now, all of you have sent us your questions earlier this month, and we found the best people to answer those questions. Google developer advocates, Florina and Amrit. We asked them to record their answers specifically for this broadcast, and we'll bring them on right after I share with you these top five updates from India's developer ecosystem. The Google for Startups Accelerator aims to nurture and support the best startups in our ecosystem. We'll mentor and accelerate some of the top startups that are using AI and ML to solve for India-specific problems in areas like agri-tech, healthcare, and specifically startups that are solving for the post-COVID world. If you want to know more about our accelerator and how you can engage, check out the link in the description below. Developer Student Clubs. These are university-based community groups for students who are interested in Google developer technologies. In 2019, in India alone, we had 200 such clubs across the country. These communities are managed by a student lead. If you want to be a lead, express your interest by the 1st of June by clicking on the link in the description. For the first time in India, 35 of India's Women Tech Maker Ambassadors came together to conduct an online summit to mark the International Women's Day season. The summit saw industry leaders, developer experts, and entrepreneurs talking about the latest in machine learning, entrepreneurship, as well as leadership. You can catch all the action from the India summit in this link. Whether you are an aspiring developer, a student developer, or a professional, we have programs that will interest you. Check out the link below to see how you can join a developer community near you. I know you can't wait to have your Kotlin questions answered, but before I leave you, I'm happy to announce that our next Ask Google Devs India episode will be on Android. So if you have any questions on Android, drop them at this link by 7th of June. Now we're really delighted to bring Florina and Amrit, who are both developer advocates for Android at Google. And here they come, right into your homes to clear all your doubts on Kotlin. Happy learning. Hi everyone, I'm Amrit Sanjeev, and together with Florina and Amrit Nesku, we'll answer the top 10 questions on Kotlin that you've shared with us. So let's start. First question, what is the difference between val, var, and const, and where should they be used? Val and var are used to define variables. You would use val for read-only variables that are only assigned once when they're initialized. These are similar to the final variables in the Java programming language. In this code snippet, the speaker's variable is only initialized once. Its content can be modified afterwards, but the variable cannot be reassigned. Vars are variables that can be assigned multiple times. For example, here, the current speaker is once set to Amrit, then set to Florina. But prefer vowels whenever possible. Like this, you're keeping your references immutable, making it easier to reason about and less likely to create bugs. In some cases, you might know the value of a property at compile time. To mark it as a compile time constant, use the const modifier. But these values need to satisfy a series of constraints. They should be top-level properties or members of an object class or of a companion object. They have to be primitive type or a string. And finally, they're not allowed to have a custom getter. Okay, Amrit, it's your turn. What are the visibility modifiers in Kotlin? Let's start with what a visibility modifier is. Visibility modifiers are modifiers that can be appended to a class, interface, property, or function in Kotlin. It is used to define where all it is visible and from where all it can be accessed. There are four visibility modifiers in Kotlin, private, 
protected, internal and public. Public is used by default, which means that your declarations will be visible everywhere. If you mark a declaration private, it will only be visible inside the file containing the declaration. Whereas declarations that are marked with a protected modifier are visible inside the file containing the declaration and the subclasses. Hence, this modifier is not allowed for top level declarations. If you mark it as internal, it's visible everywhere in the same module. Variables and classes declared in one module cannot be accessed in another. That brings me to the next question. How do you handle nullability in Kotlin? Can you get null point exceptions in Kotlin? One of the reasons why I like Kotlin is because of how nullability is handled. In Kotlin, nullability is part of the type system. For example, a variable needs to be declared from the beginning as nullable or non-nullable. Nullable types are marked with a question mark. Non-nullable variables cannot be assigned a null value, and nullable variables need to be checked for nullability before being used as non-null. If you don't want to check for null explicitly, you can use the question mark safe call operator. As a best practice, you should make sure you address the null case for a nullable object. Otherwise, your app could get in an unexpected state as your application won't crash anymore with null pointer exception. So you won't know that these errors exist. There are two ways to check for null. First one, using if checks. Because of smartcast and null check, the Kotlin compiler knows that the string value is non null. So it allows us to use the reference directly without the need for the safe call operator. Next, number two, the Elvis operator, the question mark colon. It allows us to say, if the object is non null, return the object. Otherwise, return something else. You can still get null pointer exception in Kotlin. If you know that something is never going to be null, you can use the null assertion exclamation mark exclamation mark, also known as bang bang operator, because you can shoot yourself in the foot with it. This operator converts any value to a non null type, throwing null pointer exception if the value is null. Next, you can get a null pointer exception when accessing a null reference of a platform type. So if you're accessing an object coming from a Java API that's not annotated with nullable. And lastly, you get a null pointer exception if you're explicitly throwing a null pointer exception. So now you know how to save yourself from null pointer exceptions. So let's talk about constructors. Are constructors missing in Kotlin? How do you declare one? In Kotlin, there's a concept of primary and secondary constructor. The main difference between them that you will notice is that primary constructor will only do variable initialization and no other operation or logic can be added there. The primary constructor is part of the class header. The class can also declare secondary constructors, which is prefixed with a keyword constructor. You must call the primary constructor from the secondary constructor explicitly. Also, the property of a class cannot be declared inside the secondary constructor. Other things to keep in mind are, if you have a non-abstract class that does not declare any constructors, a primary constructor with no arguments will automatically be generated. By default, the visibility of a constructor will be public. If you don't want your class to have a public constructor, you need to declare an empty primary constructor with a non-default visibility. I hope this answers your question well. Florina, we keep hearing about higher order functions and Lambda. Can you explain what they are? In Kotlin, functions are a first class citizen, which means that they can be stored in variables, they can be passed as a parameter to another function, or functions can return other functions. A function that takes another function as a parameter or returns a function is called a high order function. Lambda expressions are functions that are not declared, but passed as an expression. We heard about higher order functions, but there's one special function in Kotlin, init. All right, what is an init block? Init block runs right after the primary constructor, where you can write some logic that needs to be run for all instances during creation, like maybe setting up the logging infrastructure for your objects. Secondary constructor calls a primary constructor first. So the order of execution is more like primary constructor first, then init block, and then the secondary constructor in case the object is initialized using the secondary constructor. 
Moving on to the next question. Why and how can we declare functions outside a class? Another functions question, that's great. Kotlin provides the ability to declare functions and properties outside of any class, object, or interface. In the Java programming language, whenever you need some utility functionality, you would most likely create a util class and declare that functionality as a static function. But in Kotlin, you can declare top-level functions without having a class. However, Kotlin also provides the ability to create extension functions. These are functions that extend a certain type, but are declared outside of that type. But as such, they have an affinity to that type. To extend the functionality of a class, either because you don't own the class or because it's not open to inheritance, Kotlin created special declarations called extensions. Kotlin supports extension functions and extension properties. So, extension functions help you statically extend types. I heard that you can have a static-like functionality with companion objects. Let's hear more about what these are. The companion object is like a singleton. The variables and functions declared there are similar to static variables and functions when compared to Java programming language. They can be accessed via the name of the containing class and is initialized when the class is first loaded. Be aware that the companion object is a proper object on its own and can have its own supertypes and you can assign it to a variable and pass it around. If you're integrating with Java code and need a true static member, you can annotate a member inside a companion object with the JVM static annotation. Let's jump on to the next question. What are scope functions and where are we supposed to use them? Scope functions allow us to execute code only in the context of a specific object without needing to access the object based on its name. In Kotlin, we have five scope functions, let, apply, with, run, and also. Short and powerful, all of these functions have a receiver, this, may have an argument, it, and may return a value. You will decide which one to use depending on what you want to achieve. For top-level initialization, use run. For null check, let. If you're chaining operations, here's what you can use depending on what operation you do. For object configuration, use apply. For setting a side effect, use also. If you want to map something, use let. Here's a handy cheat sheet to help you remember all of this. OK, one last question, Amrit, I promise. How are Kotlin coroutines different from threads or RxJava? Let's start with threads. The operating system is the one that switches running threads preemptively according to its scheduler, which is an algorithm in the operating system kernel. With coroutines, the programmer and the programming language determine when to switch coroutines. In other words, tasks are cooperatively multitasked by pausing and resuming functions at predetermined points, typically in a single kernel thread. Similar to thread, coroutines can run concurrently, wait for and communicate with each other, with the difference that creating them is way cheaper than creating threads. A coroutine is using something called a dispatcher to determine what thread or threads the corresponding coroutine uses for its execution. You as a programmer will determine when to switch dispatchers. For example, you might want to read a data from a file on the IO thread. So for this, you would use the dispatcher.io that under the hood uses the IO thread. If you want to learn more about coroutines, I would strongly suggest watching the Kotlin Coroutines 101 video published in the Android Developer YouTube channel. Coming to RxJava, Coroutines and RxJava share some similarity. They are both used to deal with the complexity of multi-threading, but they take different approaches to this goal. For example, RxJava uses reactive programming principles, whereas Coroutine does not force reactiveness. I hope this makes it clear. Thank you, Florina and Amrit, for answering the questions on Kotlin. If you'd like to know about the latest shows and updates from Google Devs India, why don't you hit subscribe button and follow us on Twitter. Don't forget to drop your questions on Android in the link below. That's all for now, folks. Stay safe and see you next month.